Hi, and welcome to this lesson on calculations involving Born Harbour cycles. Make sure you've gone through the previous lessons before heading on to this, because we've covered a lot of things that we need to be able to apply. So we previously learned, of course, about Born Harbour cycles as an intro and how they illustrate the enthalpy changes involved in the formation of ionic compounds. So we learned about the direct route and the indirect route. And we had a look at how to construct those as well and at the different stages of each one. Now we're gonna have a look at how we can actually use calculations to find an unknown value. A quick reminder, so born harbour cycles use Hess's law. So it's a thermodynamic cycle or a thermochemical cycle and we have every single enthalpy change required to make uh, an ionic compound. So lattice enthalpies, they can't be directly measured. So like you saw with Hess cycles before, we can use a born harbour cycle to use known values to calculate an unknown value indirectly. So we use Hess's law. Let's have a quick reminder. It tells you that the total enthalpy change of reaction is the same, independent of the route taken. A born harbour cycle illustrates the relationship between all the different steps that come together to show the enthalpy change to form an ionic compound. There are lots of steps involved. So it's made up of many different stages and they each correspond to a different type of enthalpy change, hence why the definitions, you really, really need to be confident with them. If you've got the values for all of the stages but one, then we can work out that unknown using all of the knowns. Because that's Hess's law. Here we've got a born harbour cycle of sodium chloride and I've labelled all the roots. It doesn't matter what I've labelled them, but we can see we've got A, B, C, D, E and F. So each one of those is an enthalpy change. So to work out F, this one over here, we can use all of the other values to calculate the unknown. I can write an expression for F, so a true expression. So we can say that F this arrow here is equal to minus E, because I'm going backwards up the arrow. And then remember, think about how what direction we're going in. So we're going over to here, minus E, minus D, because I'm going down the D arrow, minus C, minus B, but then plus A, because at the end, I'm going with the arrow. So we can see here, I've written out here, delta F is minus E, minus D, minus C, minus B, plus a. Be really careful the direction that you go through those arrows. And then I can put those values in. Being careful to use brackets to ensure that I don't mess up any of my pluses or minuses. So minus the value for E, which is minus 349, which is over here. And then I can work out my unknown, which is minus 787 kilojoules per mole. A top tip always check the direction of your arrows so that you don't get confused about positive or negative values. It's very, very important because you can very quickly get an incorrect answer because if you're going with the arrow in the direction of the arrow, it's positive. If you're going backwards down an arrow, it is a negative value that you need to enter in. You might be asked to calculate any of the stages in the born harbour cycle. So there we were calculating the lattice enthalpy, but they might ask you to calculate the enthalpy of atomization, for example. It doesn't matter. You can still write a true expression. So one root, whatever your atomization is, for example, is equal to, and then work out your root, write an expression, and put your values in. Just make sure you're going through the arrows in the right direction. The process is exactly the same, and you'll calculate your unknown. When you get a value for lattice enthalpy, a lot of students don't know what that means. It's just a number, but it's really, really useful. So lattice enthalpies from born harbour cycles are sometimes higher, actually, because we're indirectly, we haven't done an experiment, we're indirectly calculating it, but they're actually higher than the true value, the calculated true value. Um, and so there are assumptions that we're making here. This is because many ionic compounds aren't actually purely ionic. They've got some covalent character. We teach you that there is covalent bonding and ionic bonding. There's actually a spectrum and there's an awful lot in between where there's ionic and covalent character coming across. So this is a really good example of that happening. So an assumption for the perfect ionic model, they're here. It assumes that all ions are totally spherical, that they have an even charge distribution, the attractions are purely electrostatic, and that there's no covalent character in the bonds. But, of course, there's a but. 
the experimentally calculated value is actually more exothermic than the theoretical value. Now, what we've been doing is theoretically calculating it indirectly, theoretically. But if you actually did the experiment, it's more exothermic. So why is that? So the perfect ionic model is theoretical. There's a deviation from the experimentally calculated by value. The evidence is that many ionic compounds have some degree of covalent character. And we've got an example here of magnesium chloride. So a theoretical that we calculated through, for example, a Born Harbor cycle, but the experimental value, when we actually did the experiment and recorded our results, was more exothermic. Remember, don't say it's lower, it's more exothermic. Because if we're thinking number lines, you might confuse the reader. So this is evidence that there's actually stronger bonding forces present than if it was purely ionic. We know that covalent bonds are stronger than our electrostatic attractions in ionic. So this is implying that there's some covalent character going on here, a stronger bond. Remember we said in the first lesson, 